Welcome back to part two of my walkthrough for the Model A cylinder head install. In this video, we'll cover final assembly of the cylinder head and the rest of the engine. If your engine has been sitting for a few months while you work on it, it's a good idea to pre-lube the cylinders with a little bit of motor oil. You can also put the oiler down the distributor bore and give it a few good squeezes to try to lubricate the valve train. Once you've done that, I like to take this opportunity to set piston number one to top dead center. It'll never be easier than right now with the head off, and it saves you time later on. Put some brake cleaner on a lint-free rag and do a thorough wipe down of the block surface and then the head surface. These surfaces need to be as clean as possible. Now you're ready to install the cylinder head studs. So as I was putting this video together in the editor, I realized I didn't have a shot that talked about the use of RTV silicone gasket maker on the studs. So I came back in to do a reshoot. Um, unfortunately, I've already assembled the engine, so I can't demo this for you on the actual studs, but I've got an ARP stud here that we can use, and uh, y'all can just use your imagination. So the decision that we're looking at here is, do you put anything on these stud threads before you thread them into the block. Now originally these would have been installed dry at the factory uh, and you can certainly do it that way if you want. The two treatments that you often do see are anti-seize and RTV silicone and the reason these treatments are often recommended is that it's very common for untreated stud threads over 10, 20, 50, 90 years uh, they corrode they seize right in the block. And if a stud seizes in the block, often when you try to remove it, it'll break, and then you got a real problem on your hands. So uh, do a favor to the next owner to come after you and treat your stud threads. Now, you certainly can use anti-seize if you're confident that there's no chance, no chance of coolant getting into any of your stud bores. However, on my engine block, there is a hairline crack between two water jackets that runs right through a stud bore. So that means that there is some non-zero chance that coolant is going to migrate into that bore. And if all you have protecting that stud is anti-seize, the coolant can slip through the anti-seize and right up to the deck and start trying to blow your head gasket. So in that scenario, RTV silicone is preferred because it seals the thread as it cures. So the coolant won't be able to migrate up to the head gasket, even if it does leak into the bore. Now, silicone isn't as good as preve at preventing corrosion as anti-seize, but in this circumstance, it's good enough. And since I'm going to need to put silicone on at least one stud, I decided I'll just go ahead and use it on all the studs in case there's more cracks that I can't see. Now, the thing to remember about silicone is that once you put it on, it's going to start to cure immediately, um, you know, within an hour or so. So you have to put it on right before you thread each stud into the block. Also remember, these studs use a class 3 thread fit, a very snug fit between the stud and the block. So you don't need a lot of silicone to seal that gap. Just a dab will do you. So what you would do is squeeze a little bit onto your finger, and then you just rub it onto the stud threads. Try to get a thin, even layer all the way around the lower threads, right? These ones down here at the end. You don't need to cover the entire thread length because what will happen is as you thread it in, the excess amount on the lower threads gets squeezed up onto the upper threads. Now, make sure you put it on the correct threads, right? So you've got fine threads here for the, for the cylinder head nuts and coarse threads here for the block. So you want the end with the coarse threads that's going into the block. If you put it on the fine threads by mistake, then you're gonna have to stop and clean that end off really well or else it'll screw up your torque values later on. Also, try not to get any on the bottom of the stud because in most cases, you want these studs to bottom out. You don't want anything underneath them. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program. On the Model A engine block, the cylinder head studs are traditionally numbered according to the conventional tightening sequence. The 8, 11, and 13 studs are longer than the others. The 8 is slightly longer, while the 11 and 13 studs are almost twice as long. I find it helpful to install these studs first to reduce the chance of mix-ups. 
be sure to thread each stud all the way down until it stops, unless you need to back them out a couple of turns, as we talked about in part one of this video. Carefully remove any excess silicone that's collected around the stud. Continue until all 14 studs have been installed and cleaned. Your next step is to test fit the head gasket. The gasket should fit over the studs with minimal adjustment. If it won't fit, check whether one or more studs are bent. An engine builder I know used to say, if the gasket drops, the head drops. And that's exactly what you're doing here, making sure the head will drop over the studs when you put it into position. The next step here is optional. Typically, a Model A deck surface will have minor divots or scratches in it, and these can make it harder for the head gasket to seal properly. So what I'm doing here is applying a product called Fluid Weld. It's a polymer that is used to fill gaps and cracks in metal surfaces that will be exposed to very high heat, like um, valve seats, for example. You should only use this for small repairs in areas that will be under the gasket, not in the combustion chamber. You can see I'm applying a few drops of fluid weld, and then I use a toothpick to flatten it into the gap, and then I use a razor blade to scrape off any excess. You want to do this right before you put the head on. I mean, not like seconds before, but you know, in the same session that you're putting the head on. You don't want it to dry out. Another important step before you put the head on is to make sure the lower distributor shaft is well oiled. Give it a good coat of motor oil all around and then install it into the distributor bore. Because my deck surface has a lot of irregularities, I'm using a copper gasket spray on one side of the head gasket. The graphite gasket doesn't require any sealant if the sealing surface is nice and flat. But in my case, I'd like a little extra insurance, so I'm spraying the bottom side of the gasket only. And then I'll let it tack for about a minute, and then I'll give it another coat. Now you're ready to drop the gasket over the studs for real. If you used copper spray sealant, make sure you wear gloves so you don't get copper on your skin. Check the edges of the gasket to make sure that they line up nicely with the edge of the block. Now go ahead and drop the cylinder head assembly with the water pump attached, as I showed you in part one, into position. It's easier if you have a buddy, uh, particularly if you're using a cast iron head. If you're doing it on your own, you might have to get creative. Once the head is in place, mount the distributor. Make sure the distributor index pin drops fully into the hole in the cylinder head. Make sure the distributor is sitting flush with the head and hasn't gotten hung up on the lower shaft or otherwise not in the proper position. Now install the distributor lock screw, the ignition cable, and the cable clamp that fits over stud number eight. If you decided in part one to remove or otherwise alter the clamp, uh, now is the time to do that if you've not done that already. Now it's time to install the water outlet. If you're using a copper gasket, coat all surfaces liberally with gasket sealant. This one takes a few minutes to cure before assembly. Finally, it's time to put the head nuts on. As with everything in the Model A world, people disagree about the best lubricant for head nuts or whether you use lubricant at all. Most engine builders I know use a little motor oil on the threads and under the bearing surface of the nut. So that's what I'm going to do here. Once you get those cylinder head nuts hand tightened, it's time to torque them to the full torque in sequence. If you've seen my video on torque and tightening sequences, then you know the drill. If not, now is a good time to watch that. The link is in the upper right. So this is the sequence published by Murray Fonstock in 1967. It's the oldest uh, sequence I've been able to find. So we're going to use this with uh, one slight uh, amendment. And um, so Fonstock has you torque to 50 foot-pounds uh, in thirds. So you go a third of the way each time until you're up to 50. And he has you do this sequence, which is uh, sort of a star sequence. Um, and I'm going to stick to that, except that I'm going to swap 11 and 14 uh, so that I can do the um, 
water outlet studs together. So that's, this is all explained in the other video, but this is the sequence we're gonna use, so let's get to it. One thing that can come as an unpleasant surprise when you start trying to torque down your cylinder head nuts, if you've installed the distributor, which you probably did if you are leaving the ignition cable clamp in place, as we discussed in the pre-assembly video, if you've already installed your distributor, then when you go to torque that very first nut, you can't get to it because the distributor is in the way. What to do? Well, you can try taking the distributor off several times. It's a gigantic pain. Or you can get this little guy. So this is a cylinder head obstruction wrench. I've got a 3 8 to 1 half adapter on it, so it'll work with my torque wrench. But basically this is just a socket wrench on one end, and it is a, an 11 16 socket on the other end. And what this does is it allows you to get under the distributor and torque that number one nut. So now you can see I'm able to get in there and torque that nut perfectly easily. And because the socket of the torque wrench is still centered directly over the nut, there's no change in the torque. The torque reading and the clamp load will be exactly the same. Tightening 14 head nuts is not visually that interesting, let alone tightening 14 head nuts three times. So I'm only going to show the process one time through. Notice that I'm using a box wrench to break each nut loose before raising it to the next torque value. Now, I used 20 foot-pounds for the first pass, and then 35, and then 50. As I discussed in my video on tightening sequences, you don't have to use those values, or that number of passes, or even this sequence of nuts. There's a wide range of procedures that work equally well most of the time. When all the nuts have been fully tightened, then you can go ahead and finish the engine assembly. First, get your fan belt on. I find it's easier to get the belt on if you do it before you attach the radiator hoses. The fan belt circuit is one thing that varies a lot from one A to another. So you might have a, a two, four, or a six-bladed fan. Uh, there are two common types of generators. This one's actually a 1932 generator that uh, Tom Wiesenberg up in Minneapolis just finished rebuilding. Thanks, Tom. Uh, plus various alternators in use. And while the crankshaft pulleys are mostly the same, the clearance from the pulley to the cross member, which you can just barely see in there, uh, that varies a lot. In some cars, it can be very hard to get the belt under the pulley because it's so close to the cross member. The way you get the belt on is you uh, put it around the fan first and then around the crankshaft pulley. Then you loosen the generator on its mounting. You can see right there in the center the mounting bolt. So you're going to loosen that and then you're going to basically tip the generator uh, toward the motor. And then you get the belt, get the belt on the generator and then you're going to um, pull the generator back toward you, hold it tight and tighten the mounting bolt to hold the generator in position. Now it's a big bolt, so you can make it really tight to hold the generator steady. Uh, but some folks do like to, you can put a little brace right here that attaches to the tying cover that kind of braces the generator if you want to. Um, that bolt, by the way, that bolt under there is a good candidate for anti-seize. In terms of how loose the belt ought to be, the general rule is you only need to tighten it for cause. So in other words, if it starts to slip or squeal. So you can see my belt. Actually, quite a lot of play, but that's okay. Um, that's all right. A couple inches is quite all right. If it's not squealing, you should just leave it. Don't put too much tension in it because you're because you're pulling laterally on all of those um, all the components in the circuit. Once the belt is on, install the radiator hose. Got your upper radiator hose right here. This is a thermostat. If you haven't seen one before. 
This is a 160 degree thermostat. And the rule with thermostats is the pointy end goes up in the direction of the water flow, which in this case is uh, up. So you just need to, when you insert this, just keep an eye on which direction you're inserting it in and make sure that that's the direction you install the hose in. The other thing, two other things about the hose. Um, first, make sure that you put your clamps on before you put it on. And then second, uh, these, um, this will go on a little bit easier if you coat these in a little bit of dish soap. Uh, it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, it's perfectly fine being in the system. Just a little bit of dish soap on either end really helps it to uh, slide right on. The Model A parts vendors sell two types of hose. Uh, there's this kind, and then there's one that is black with a red stripe. They're both fine, they're both authentic, both work. So to install the upper hose, you first need to detach these radiator support rods, and then um, you're going to basically tip the radiator toward the front of the car. So you pull it toward you. It'll, it should give a little. It's, on, it's uh, mounted on springs. So you're gonna tip it toward you, and then uh, this, well, that'll give you enough room to get this into position. If you have the red and black hose, on a 28 or 29, you may need to shorten that hose a little. It might be a little too long, but that should let you get the hose on. Now, actually, I've done I've done these clamps wrong. <laughs> I've done them backwards. The head is supposed to be on the driver's side, but you know it still works. It's just uh, not going to get any points for that. Um, and the really critical thing is slide the hose on. Remember your dish soap, and then you have to reattach and tighten down these rods before you tighten the clamps. Otherwise, uh, you can get this out of position. Your next step is to fill the radiator. If you didn't drain it all the way before, you should do that now. For the gasket break-in, it's a good idea to use 100% distilled water in the cooling system, just the first couple of times you start the engine. The reason is that if you've made some kind of serious mistake, or your gasket compresses a lot, or your block is warped, you didn't realize it, when the coolant leaks into wherever it's going to leak, well, it's just water. If a little bit gets into the cylinders, it's okay. It'll boil off. Whereas, if you fill with antifreeze, ethylene glycol, right away, uh, well, now you got coolant everywhere that you have to clean up. So stick with water. I guess unless you're doing this in the dead of winter in North Dakota, uh, in which case you should use your best judgment. My recommendation is that you fill the radiator gradually, slowly, and pay attention as you fill it, because if it starts to leak, you wanna find that out right away. So when I was uh, shooting this video, as I, um, as I was refilling my radiator, I actually had, uh, I started to have a leak right there. I was filling it up and all of a sudden water started to gush right out of here. And uh, long story short, that's why this part two is coming out two months after part one, because that started me on a whole slew of things. But um, I also, so there was that leak, and then when I was filling this up, I also started to have a leak, I think right here, because I hadn't tightened this proper, this wasn't properly placed. So just go real slowly, you know, you could get a leak here, you could get a leak here, you could get a leak right here, you could have a leak like around your water pump. There's a lot of places you could have a leak and that first filling of the radiator is a good time uh, to discover that as opposed to when you know the car is on or you've left it sitting for a few hours. Another thing you can do if you've still got your spark plugs out, mine are in, but if you've got yours out, you can perform a compression test. I mean, if you've just put oil around the cylinders like we did earlier in the video, uh, then that will give you some pretty accurate results. And that'll give you a baseline reading for use in the future. It, should you decide to run the test, if you do, the next step is install your spark plugs. Uh, if your new head is aluminum, then I recommend putting some anti-seize on those threads. And then you attach your spark plug connectors to the distributor body and your high tension wire to the coil. And then you reconnect your spark control rod. Now my uh, spark plug connectors are, as you can probably tell, non-standard. 
Um, and that's because this is the Winfield 7 to 1 high compression head, which relocates the plug holes to um, between the intake and exhaust valves rather than over the intake, which is where the stock head puts them. Um, I actually got a stock head right here. So this is the stock head. And you can see these are close together. There's a pair here and then there's a pair right there. So those are over the intake valves. Um, but then if you look on the one I've got, they're evenly spaced. So because of that, the, um, the stock connectors, those brass or bronze leads, they don't work. And so I had to fabricate my own, but uh, you probably won't. You, you, know, you probably have a very normal head. All right, so once you've done all that, do your final check, right? Check your oil, right? Check your dipstick, make sure your oil's full, make sure your gas is flowing, uh, do all that, and then you will be ready to start the engine with its new cylinder head. Yeah, so a quick aside, uh, I mentioned earlier that the radiator had caused me to um, wait about two months between releasing part one of this video and part two. So uh, the, what actually happened is it kind of set me on this uh, course of a lot of changes ended up being made. So just some things that ended up being changed between part one and part two of this video. I'm just going to go around and like see what occurs to me. Um, this battery cable's new. This entire wiring harness is new. Uh, that, uh, quick, um, this rod is new. This rod's been messed with. Um, this generator, obviously, completely new. As I said, the wiring harness. Um, these headlight, not the buckets, but everything inside the headlight buckets is new. Um, and yeah, the spark plug wires, I have fabricated those. New high tension. Uh, line. The coil is completely new. Uh, parts of the terminal box are new. <sighs> it was a long couple of, couple of months there. Anyway, but I didn't want to include that in the video because it has nothing to do with the cylinder head.